All right, thanks everyone for coming. Very excited to be here. Uh, I have about 35 programs. They're all, they all compile, they're all hosted on Godbolt. So at some point, if you want to harvest the links, you can get the slides at this address. Uh, what is Circle? Just a few bullets. Uh, C++20 compiler that I wrote. It's about 260,000 lines. I'm working on it for more than five and a half years. It's a pretty typical Linux compiler. It uh, consumes both the GCC and the LLVM uh, standard uh, libraries. And it is conformant with the Itanium C++ API, which gives it a lot of portability. Uh, primarily, I think of it as a laboratory for language evolution. Most of the audience debate I've seen this week has been on philosophical grounds. Uh, in the opening keynote, Dave compared the study of generic programming to the search for truth. That makes him a classical philosopher. He can be that because he's designing a language from base principles and he wants to understand the principles. But I'm extending a very old and very messy language. I see language evolution like biological evolution, and that makes me a Darwinist. I care about the survival of C++. I don't want it to suffer from an extinction event. I don't want it to die out because it can't compete for resources. Um, I'm continually adding, changing, and removing features from the compiler. And the ones that survive to this point are the ones that I think makes the compiler better adapted to the challenges that programmers face. I have a bunch of like corny uh, evolution jokes, but I think I'll just sum this up and say that I'm really interested in fitness. That's the goal for me. As opposed, to, as opposed to beauty. The goal of the talk is to convince you that incremental changes can substantially improve expressiveness and compile time programming. I'm providing many examples in the form of new features on how to cut into the language to extend it. So this would be ways to get into the grammar, ways to get into the semantics, ways to um, change yet retain compatibility with the past. I'm presenting many new features, and each one is a dot, and I hope by the end a picture will resolve for, for every one of you. So in that sense, it's kind of important that I get through the slides so that there, because I hope that the uh, totality of the features makes the, makes the goal of the talk more clear to you. Uh, what are some of the circle features? There are single pass heterogeneous uh, targets, so I am an excellent CUDA compiler. I compile um, OpenGL and Vulkan shaders and Direct3D shaders. This is all single source single translation pass. Uh, I do pattern matching. I was at CPP Con last year and participated in Herb's keynote where I implemented his pattern matching proposal. I've had reflection that was part of this project from the very beginning. User-defined attributes, that's really part of reflection, but I think it's so cool that I gave it its own bullet. Compile time execution is kind of the most known aspect of this compiler. It's like non-controversial. Everyone's fully on board with it. <laughs> and I have dynamic slices and list comprehension, which kind of, um, brings some Python-esque uh, qualities and conveniences to the language, so you can uh, treat collections like slices. Um, I'm not talking about any of that today. I'm talking about features that will help us change the metaprogramming paradigm. I, template metaprogramming has always been powered by abuses of recursion and argument deduction. I want imperative and declarative facilities to do the work. So at every step, I'm going to take away a little bit of the need for recursion and argument deduction and give you more expressive mechanisms. Um, when you bring up a C++ compiler, you deal with a lot of other people's template metaprogramming. I'm burned out on this stuff. I've lost my sense of humor about it. I badly want it replaced with methods that are intelligible. That's, that's really maybe the, the ultimate goal of this, is to even uh, convince you that that's possible, that we don't have to continue doing this. There's two parts. Uh, first one, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of features at you. Um, and then we're going to look at the three nastiest standard template library classes and rewrite them using these features. Um, what makes tuple, variant, and MD span, which is a new uh, type in 23, what makes them so difficult to think about and difficult to use? And I think it's because they deal with generic collections. Um, and a major way I've extended the language is by drastically improving the capability of parameter packs. Um, a language's standard library is written by the language's most skilled programmers, usually. And the standard library code should be an advertisement for a language, but in C++, it's a warning. So I'd like to be able to express our intent and express best practices and express our aspirations through the text of the standard library. Okay, let's start with something small. The first thing is to double the kinds of template parameters from three to six. So I've added universal template parameters. There's a P1985 excellent proposal. 
You can think of it as a universal parameter, as a wild card. It will match any kind of template argument, and then you can forward it as another template argument. Concepts. For some reason, concepts launch without the ability to pass them as template parameters. So this hurts composability. How do I pass a concept to a concept to create you know, something more specific and more, more flexible? Uh, this has been added. And I added support to pass variable templates as template parameters um, so they can feel included too. This is a real quick example of the six kinds of template parameters on the top. Uh, they're very easy to distinguish. I like using the universal template parameter template auto because it's a wild card. So I can do a template auto dot, dot, dot. And this now will accept any kind of type yielding uh, al alias template or type template. You don't have to worry if it's got non-types or template template parameters. It'll accept any kind of variable template. It'll accept any kind of concept. Um, and at the bottom of the main function, I'm just passing a type, a non-type, a type template, a variable template, a concept, and some other thing. In this case, it's the enumeration. And in the function, I can print out the, the uh, string string constant representing each of these parameters. And that's a little bit of reflection. So let's uh, take an example of the power of passing concepts. Uh, concept parameters allow composition of concepts. The concept tuple-like of evaluates a logical fold expression by specializing its concept template, parameter C, over the tuple element types of the template parameter T. Now, t.tuple elements, that's a circleism. And I've tried to wrap or model uh, language features around the customization points and the type traits and the numeric limits that are in the standard library. So when you say t.tuple elements, that instantiates the tuple size, and it reads out the value, it creates a pack of that size, and then it probes std tuple element to get the type, and it gives you all of that as a pack. So then I can feed those all through C, and I can fold over it. And I'm using it on line 12. So now I've got a type constraint, tuple like of, specialized over std integral, and this will pass when uh, auto tup deduces to a type that is tuple-like, as in it specializes the customization points, and each of its tuple elements pass that std integral um, concept. So you can see the, three, the four uses in main, uh, the first three are tuple-like containers that only have integral types, and the last one has a character pointer, so it errors. So I think this is like a pretty natural uh, evolution. There are six kinds of template parameters, six kinds of packs. They're of great importance, so there's a lot of new functionality to make them, uh, to make them effective. The compiler provides operators to subscript and to slice packs. Uh, I use Python-style extended slice notation for slices, where the third operand is a step counter. Use a negative step to slice in reverse order. Negative indices are kind of from right to left, so minus one is the last element, minus two is the second to last element, and so on. Pack subscript is the first language extension I implemented when I began writing this compiler. I've been using it for more than five years, and it's really hard to write code without it. Uh, Chris gave a perfect talk yesterday on the subject of pack subscripting. Uh, he had a survey of a bunch of techniques including Circle's built-in pack subscript operator. All the other ones are based on argument deduction and template recursion. And the last one, Circle, he means he just used the built-in operator I have. And he did compile time benchmarking. So uh, the, the x-axis is the number of elements in the tuple. So he drives it up to pretty high numbers because he works in HFT, and apparently they have big tuples. They have big data. And so this really shows the asymptotics of all these techniques. And um, Along the x-axis, there's a gray line. That's not the x-axis. That's the circle compile times. <laughs> so when you get rid of all the other techniques, so you can rescale the y-axis, which right now is at 31 seconds. So you get the, the circle uh, y-axis at 0.09 seconds. And well, it's constant time in the subscript, and there's some other uh, costs for, for sizing the tuple. So he, he's using this new tuple subscript operator uh, to, to replace other techniques from Boost or handwritten ones, and the performance is, I mean, it's, it's, it's much better. <laughs> All right, this is how you use the subscript. It's just dot, 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 square bracket. I'm um, subscripting, here, subscripting a template parameter pack TS. I'm subscripting a function pack X. You can subscript any of the six uh, template parameter packs. You do it at zero to get the first element. You do it at minus one to get the last element. Do it at any arbitrary constant, and it gives you back the value there in constant time. Um, and I can use that dot string again to kind of get some reflection. This gives me a compile time string. So I'm passing it an int, uh, an, uh, a short, an int, a long, a float, and a double. And you see the first and the last are short 10 and double 50. And uh, I can do slices. So I can slice uh, 
a parameter pack into a function argument list or into a template argument list or into a braced initializer. Uh, this is Python style. So the, each of the three operands are optional. So if you don't provide one, it just defaults to the beginning or the end or the, the step by one. So in the first case, I'm starting at the beginning. I'm slicing to the midway point, then I'm expanding that uh, slice. And the second function call, I'm starting at the midpoint, then expanding to the end. And the third one, I'm starting at one, expanding to the end, or slicing to the end, and then stepping by two. So I'm getting all the odds in that function pack. And the last one, I'm just going to say colon, colon, minus one, which is to do it in reverse order. Hmm? No, I'm getting, I'm getting the odds. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's not with the value, it's the index, the ordinal of the, the pack. <laughs> That's, I, yeah. Um, I can also slice and expand directly into expression statements. So there's no reason to like build a fold expression with comma, abuse the comma operator, and then try to expand in a fold. I think you should just be able to um, expand and discard. So each of these pack elements are discarded. Uh, same, same thing here. I'm, I'm printing out uh, a slice of the first half of the pack and expanding it right in line. So it's the same output, but I'm not passing it to a function. I've got tuples, subscripts, and slices, so you don't have to write a std get if you don't want. Um, you can just use this index operator. This is in P1858, uh, one of Barry's proposals. I had this feature in for a long time, but he suggested single dot, square bracket to distinguish it from packs. I think that's a good choice. Size of dot also calls std's tuple size for you, and you can slice. So this is really beautiful. You can take a tuple or a std array or a std pair and just use a dot, square bracket, colon, and that turns into a pack. And it will call uh, std get, even you know, with ADL and everything else, to, to get at that for you. And if you're using this at the end of an argument list, you can just use dot, dot, dot. That's shorthand for turning it into a pack and then expanding it. And you can see cases later where it just makes the code like melt away. Structure name tuples. The advantage of providing specific operators for tuples is that you can provide the same operator for non-tuples. So if you have an aggregate or any other class with non-static public data members, you can query the number of non-static public data members with the same operator size of dot. You can access non-static data members with the subscript tuple, uh, the, the tuple subscript operator, and you can slice to return a pack of data members. So really, for all intents and purposes, any kind of structure, any aggregate especially, is equivalent to a name tuple. There's two ways to access it, by, by index or by name. And it works on built-in built -in arrays. Here's a quick example. I'm going to create a tuple of four things, and then I'm going to slice the type. And by slicing the type, I'm going to get the tuple element types. And it, it does it just like the dot tuple elements uh, keyword before. It goes to std tuple size, instantiates it, re reads out the value, creates a pack, probes std tuple element, and returns that as a pack. And then I can use reflection to get the string constant for each of those. And then I can also do the same thing for the object, for the function parameter, and spread out the data members uh, or the, the, tuple, the tuple values into a pack and print all those out. So when you run this guy, it prints out the four values. It does it on a single line, so you don't have to expand it into another uh, function parameter pack or anything, function argument list. Integer packs, never use make index sequence again. This is one of the things that I cry inside whenever I, whenever I see it, people using std make index sequence and then writing a lambda, invoking the lambda so we can deduce uh, that, in that index sequence, I've got a, a built-in generator. So it's int dot 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 n. You plug an n as a constant, and it will generate the natural number from 0 to n minus 1 as a pack. Uh, you can do it with a slice. And usually, you want integer indices when there's another pack in the expansion. So if you have another pack, just use int dot dot dot, and it, that expression will infer its size from the sizes of the other packs in the expansion. So int dot 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 is one of the most used operators I have. It, it's how you enumerate a uh, parameter pack. Uh, last CPPCon, Daisy gave a talk on code you should never write, meaning temp, yes? Uh, int dot dot dot, is that specifically int or does it take other types? Specifically int because it's just the set of numbers. Okay. Also, I like int because it's an actual type. It's int as opposed to size t. Is that unsigned long? Is it unsigned long long? Yeah. And it's not an identifier, so it's easier for the parser. So Daisy gave this talk on uh, TMP. And there's a statement, and it's very nice. It's parameter pack operations are perhaps the tasks with the greatest discrepancy between how difficult they should be and how difficult they actually are. And this is in the context specifically of enumerating pack. Let's look at the function. 
enumerate pack. It has a lambda. It's immediately invoked. And um, it deduces its index sequence, IDXS. Uh, what, what does she mean by C++20 makes it easier? It makes it easier because you can put the template parameter list on the lambda. So you can write that as a self-contained thing. You don't have to have some free function with the, uh, with the template parameter list. So you've got uh, one function enumerate pack. You have a uh, lambda function inside that. And then the user has to provide a lambda function to, to accept the index back in. So you've got to write three functions to get a number between 0 and n minus 1. So uh, my, my int dot 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 operator, my pack index operator on line 6, does it in place. So you, uh, you turn the tuple object into a pack. And that gives you the corresponding set of set of integers. So you can, you know, you can print 0, hello, 142, 2, world, 373. These are two equivalent functions, but one of them has three uh, template instantiations, template function instantiations, and the other one is all in place. That's an example of imperative programming um, replacing tasks that used to have to be recursive or uh, deduced. Conditional operators do all the work. C has A, question B, colon C. I've added three more. Um, they actually do things that are really useful, especially the second one, the multi-conditional. This is, this is the key operator in this talk. This is the switch generator. So if you know something at runtime and you want to map it to something you know at compile time, use this operator. So A is going to be a pack of bool expressions, a pack of comparisons, a pack of traits you're, you're, you're testing, pack of anything. B is a corresponding pack of values. So for the first time A is true, it's going to return the corresponding element B. If A is never true, it will return C. I was also const expert conditional, A question, question B, C, uh, colon C. This is a short circuit operator. Um, so when you do template substitution, it substitutes and evaluates A, if that's true. It substitutes and returns B. Otherwise, it substitutes and returns C. There's no common type. So if you have a, an array of different size for B and C arms, it's not going to decay those to a point, or it'll just return one or the other. And you can also pass things that aren't even values to B and C. You can pass types, you can pass variable templates, you can pass concepts, you can pass universals, because um, the uh, semantic uh, information of this is contained. We know what kind of uh, semantic conditional that is, so we can, we can really overload it and uh, have expressive short-circuited operations. And combining those two, you get the context for multi-conditional, um, which is a lot of power. And some of these standard template library classes are really difficult, and this cuts through them. So uh, maybe not for beginners, but that multi-conditional is. Let's take a look at uh, enum to string. So we have some enum that's known at runtime. It comes in as a function parameter e. And I want to print out the corresponding string, return the string. So t.enum values one of these other circleisms. It returns a pack of string constants for t. If t is not an enum, this is a substitution failure. And I'm going to compare each of those, that's a pack, with the, with the runtime value e. So that's a pack of bools. It's either true or false. Uh, no more than one of them will be true. Possibly none of them will be true. And this, this uh, whole expression expands into, into this chain of conditionals. So t.enum names is the pack of string constants. So for the first time it evaluates true, it returns the string constant. And then because it's a conditional operator, it does pointer decay, and it returns a pointer to the string constant. If none of them match, you can kind of use uh, reflection and glom together an error message, like unknown shapes t in this case. And any questions about this operator? OK. Uh, yes. What, what the first one, it's, it's, it's exactly like if you chain these together. It's probably worth mentioning that this pattern is great because LLVM is like very well trained to promote this to a switch instruction, as long as you're comparing values and not some, something else. And then it's got heuristics, and it may look at the number of arms, and it may lower that to a jump table. So this is like excellent code. Context for multiconditional. Um, substitutes the left operand until it's true, and then substitutes and returns the corresponding center operand. Um, this is usually used to map a runtime entity, or no, I'm sorry, this is used to find an index for which the compile time condition on the left is true. So let's evaluate C um, specialized on TS until it's true, and then we're going to re return the corresponding index. And as soon as it finds something that's true, it stops. So this is a way to guard against potential substitution failure. Member pack declarations. This is in that same very uh, resume proposal that 
doesn't seem to be going anywhere in committee, but it's like a really good feature. Um, it declares a, non, a pack of non-static data members. You can disambiguate dependent name lookup with leading dot, dot, dot. There's been some controversy on that token, but I think it's good. And then I've added my own C++ attribute called member names, and this takes a list of string constants. And so when you specialize, uh, or when you instantiate that member pack, if you provide this attribute, those individual member names will be given the names of the attribute. Here's an example of a bare bones tuple. Uh, it just takes a parameter pack and then it creates a pack declaration. No unique address. This is the empty base optimization that's been around C++ for uh, many years. They probably should have called it empty base optimization because I think that's a, a more clear term of what it actually does. Uh, this is in 20, but it's not really useful in 20 because there's no generic way to create non-static data members in C++ 20. So people still use, um, inherit, they still inherit from packs of base classes for, for all practical purposes. Uh, what I like about this is that um, you, can, you can specialize it easily. It creates aggregate constructors very well, aggregate initializers, but it even works with CTAD. So here I don't have, I don't have any uh, user-defined constructors. I'm not providing uh, the list of packs here, but I, I provided a long, long a float and a bool and it's able to use CTAD to deduce the types. Class template argument deduction. I didn't know it until recently either, the acronym. Um, and we see there's some reflection going on later. I can take the decal type of it and say, give me member decal strings. It's very hard to combine a type and a member name, or a type and a name in C++. It's not always type and the name because you have an array, the array decorator goes on the right hand side. So I've got some uh, member traits like member decal strings that give you both together. So it's a, a compiler accurate rendering of the, of the declaration. Uh, here's an example using the member names attribute. This is a struct of array utility. So people doing, yes? Uh, so that's mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I, I, did not I did not want to touch deduction code. At this point, if I'm adding a feature and it requires me to do much with argument deduction, I was like, ah, is it worth it? You know. So in this case, it's it should be unsurprising. I, I couldn't tell you what the deduction rules are off the top of my head, though. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So structive array. Um, consider taking a type like vec3 on line 18, which is an aggregate. It has three members. I want to decompose that and create array types of the three members. So t dot member types is a pack of types, and the types there are float, float, float in this case. So I'm creating a pack declaration, but not a float, float, float. I'm creating a pack declaration of float uh, n-sized array, float n-sized array, float n-sized array. And this is the kind of uh, transformation that game developers want, people writing codecs want, people writing trading want, because it can exploit uh, parallel compute units like, like SIMD cores. Uh, I can still access the data as a pack. You see the data of the uh, member function, uh, the return statement on line nine uh, can access as a pack. The member function on line 14 can access as a pack, but the user code probably wants to um, clone the interface from the original type. So they're dealing with a VEC3 and they want to do a structive array of VEC3. Their member names are XYZ. They can continue using those names XYZ, but now they're arrays, they're not scalars, because the member names attribute, when it, when it uh, instantiated that pack declaration, gave the individual scalar data members, the names specified in the attribute. And those names specified in the attribute were, were taken by reflecting on the parameter type T. Oh, yes? Um, instead of those being uh, static length arrays, could you stick like some did vector there? Yeah, you can do whatever you want, sure. OK, and you would get the same pack expansion of the type to yep. the members. OK, cool. Yeah, you could do std array there. You could do whatever you want. Hmm? Uh, perfect forwarding is not perfect. <clears throat> so there's a lot of functions like std tuple where there's four versions, there's eight versions, there's some number of versions because there's const, volatile, and reference qualifier combinations. And the standard typically has a pack of four, right? There's const and non-const versions of the L value and R value reference overloads. And so if you have something like std, std get, or in this case I'm just calling it extract, you're writing the same function with basically the same content three, four, five, ten times, a hundred times. Uh, and we have this mechanism Perfect forwarding. So let's try to rewrite uh, these three redundant overloads into one function. 
So we can do that for tuple. So I've got a, um, a forwarding reference tuple, and this is extract two, and this is like std get or something. And that's awesome. But then I try to do it for variant. Oops, redefinition error. Because there's no way to distinguish between the version intended for std tuple and the version intended for std variant. There's no way, because the forwarding reference just deduces whatever the argument type is. I think this is like a, a major flaw in the feature. The deducing this proposal, and this was accepted into 23, uh, has a similarly related problem caused by the same, the same defect in perfect forwarding, and they call it the shadowing problem. So they have a member function get, and you can pass the, um, when you call it, you just call it like a normal me member function, but the implicit object is no longer accessed through a this pointer, it's, uh, it's accessed through uh, an ar a function argument, in this case self. And because you don't want to write four versions of get that only differ by their constant reference qualifiers. You write one version and you use forwarding. But now, um, what happens when you inherit from B with D and you call D.get? This is a member function of B, but the type of self is D because it just deduces the type from the argument. And so now my this pointer is pointing to the wrong type. So if I say uh, self.i without any other kind of cast, it's going to get the i in the derived type, which is not what you expect. This is good for for the curiously recurring template pattern, it's pretty awful for typical usages. So they have this, this cast called like T, a C style cast because you can't express it in a single static cast. It does two things, it both uh, does a std forward, so it preserves the value category of the, of the implicit object, and it does a type upcast. It'll cast from D back up to B. Two things, uh, you have to do, is, uh, you have to do those two casts in one, and your function declaration isn't what you want. And I think this is like, the feature is really good. I mean, the deducing this feature is really good, but it just exposes another problem in, in forwarding references. So I've got this like weird fix to it where you specify a pattern after the function parameter, uh, colon type or colon template. And the CV and reference qualifiers um, will still be deduced from the argument. Now we're gonna deduce the type from that pattern. And then we're going to substitute that deduce type back into the forwarding reference parameter. And this fixes the shadowing problem. And it allows for us to collapse our four overloads or eight overloads for something like a std get into one expression. And then related to this, I have two parameter directives. So there's a contextual keyword I can put after the function parameter name, forward. And you do that after a forwarding reference function parameter. And that will automatically uh, kind of apply std forward to that parameter whenever you reference it in the function. So you can't use, you can't use std forward incorrectly. And std forward is very easy to use incorrectly. Same with move. So if you have an um, R value reference parameter, you put move after it, it'll automatically give you the X value as opposed to an L value, which you, which you have to cast. The forward one is used quite a bit, and it reduces the uh, amount of code you have to write. So let's just look at, look at the um, deduce forwarding reference. I have extract three. It's still a forwarding reference. It's a forwarding reference, and that, that changes the way the function is called. When you pass it, uh, do I have one minute remaining? Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when you pass an argument to a forwarding reference, if that argument is an L value, the type of that is replaced by an L value reference. Um, that continues to, to work as expected, and that's why reference collapsing gives us the, um, the nice behaviors of perfect forwarding. So that continues to work. But then after we have the value category and the CV qualifiers, it's then additionally deduced against the pattern on the right-hand side. So you can deduce the, the types uh, template arguments of std tuple. And now when you enter the body of extract three, uh, the tuple, um, capital tuple, capital T tuple, is a std tuple type. That means I can, I can uh, provide overloads now. So I can do one for variant. And so now I've just reduced four overloads to one without any kind of like loss of generality. And this still, matches functionally exactly the, um, the declarations in the standard. It's, it's a size T argument, and then it's a pack of types. Yes? I'm a little concerned that, that unfortunately, because the standard specifies all those overloads, that you're not strictly standard conforming when you do this. Um, I, I would like the standard police to come and arrest me, I think. Um, <laughs> In this case, I think it's functionally equivalent because the, the tuple type name at the very end, you cannot, you cannot specify that explicitly. Yeah, and there, yeah. You, you could, oh, you can't explicitly, 
You, you can, but you can't explicitly provide a, t a template argument for tuple. So in that sense, when you, if you try to explicitly provide template arguments, it behaves just like the declarations in the standard. It has to deduce tuple because it's after a pack. So in that case, it's, a, it's, like a, a, it's convenient that. Is the multiple, is the multiple constant on constant overloads that I'm concerned that you don't, that you can't emulate? Oh, you, you can. Oh, yes. Strictly. OK. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Yes, sir. Good. So requires is a constraint. You can say, uh, is this argument a tuple? If not, I'm going to fail. But that's different from what this is. This says, I want to deduce this as a tuple. And if you pass me something derived from a tuple or that has a uh, conversion operator that returns a tuple, it'll, it'll work. So, so providing overloads that has a specific type is different from taking a generic type and then testing with a constraint. Uh, one of them rejects, and, and this one will try to coerce. Yes. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Can you do that with a single static cast then? If, if it's not privately inherited. Oh, you can. OK, good. OK, the private inheritance of right. To repeat for the uh, video, uh, Ben made the point that uh, for the deducing this shadowing problem, you, you can use a static cast. And they, they used a um, C style cast as a workaround around access specifiers. Yeah. You still need a cast, though. Yeah. OK, well, this is exactly what you, what you said. OK, uh, so my solution to this is on the right hand side. Uh, line eight is my getter, and I don't have to call std forward. I don't have to call like t, so I don't even need to give a named uh, self. So I don't have a named forwarding reference. It's just auto, and that like uh, invents a parameter. So this auto ampersand ampersand that's the uh, forwarding reference self forward, and that means that whenever I name self, it'll implicitly be forward forwarded, and then colon b, and b is the type that I want to deduce. And that'll work if it's a template or not. So if, if B is a, a class template, I can still say colon B, and that'll use like the injected class name and uh, take the, the, the specialization from that, and deduction will work the same way. So these are, the definitions do the exact same thing on these two, two slides, but the declaration is different. OK, member traits. Um, there's a dot namespace in C++. If you have um, an expression on the left, and it's of class or union, then you can do a dot, and you can write an identifier, and that will do lookup for a member, a member function, or a data member or something. But what if the left-hand side is not an expression of class or union type? It means we're not using that namespace. We're not exploiting it. So I said, well, let's just um, put lots of stuff in there. So if the left-hand side's a type, there's like maybe 100 new things I've put in, which are compiler built-ins. And you say, well, that's too many compiler built-ins, but I think they're really useful. So t.enum values does reflect reflection and returns a pack of the enumerator constants. So that's, that returns a pack of values. Double dot max. This is a wrapper for std numeric limits of double, colon, colon, max, left, right. So I mean, what do you want to write? You know? U dot concept. If you use a universal template parameter, dot is concept is a const expression Boolean that tells you this thing refers to a concept during specialization. And then the type traits. There's many, many type traits that uh, adjust your type. So t dot remove pointer will strip the pointer. Uh, dot make signed will turn an unsigned value into a corresponding signed value, and then you can do a star. There's also a, a dot add pointer, but if you have a little token, just use the, the declarator. What I love about this is you can write it left to right, where if you chain type traits, you have to write from the inside out, because it's the, the inner specialization and then the, the outer specialization. So it ends up you're, you're reading from right to left, which I think is not good. Yes? Some of these yield uh, Uh, <clears throat> they're in English, so if it's plural, if it's plural, it returns a pack. If it's non-plural, it returns like a non-pack. And then like enum values, you think, well, it's got to be a value. It can't be a type. Um, there's no, there's no like convention other than like what does this mean? So I guess I guess you would just like look it up if it's unclear. But I think these are I think these are clear. They're no less clear than the type traits. And in almost every case, they're named after the corresponding thing in the library. So um, since I is there a question? Yeah. I was wondering why, like, how about the, the hexadecimal trouble um, points? Like, yeah, the scope 
So I was just wondering if you consider the syntax of doubles. Well, I, I um. I think the scope resolution operator is already more used. It's less available than dot. So if you have T colon colon X, that means something already. That means look for the static data member or member function in T. So that's, that's less convenient because it's more populated by stuff already. Yeah? Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll call the numeric limit. So right, the question is, like, do these, if you replace uh, a numeric limit or a type trait or something, or library replaces it. Like this will this will find the replacement. This is just sugar. This is sugar, but it lets you write it left to right. I just did this because hey, I've already like taken this namespace to put in like cool stuff. So I might as well put all this other stuff because it does add some value. So there's type traits. These are type categories. Uh, these are type properties. These are all the ones that just have one argument. So I don't have to worry about like argument lists. Uh, supported operations. Wow, there's a whole bunch. Uh, numeric limits. Also a good number. Um, and then I have these, they're kind of getting good now. So like C++ 23 or maybe 20, I don't know. They have a two underlying function that just converts an enum to its corresponding integer type. That's in here. So if you have a enum value, like e, you can say e dot two underlying. And that's just nicer looking than a function call. And it doesn't call a function, so there's no compile time cost. Uh, you can decompose a function type into its return type, a parameter count, or a parameter types. Or param types is a pack. So you can packify a type. Tuple types you've already seen, uh, the, you know, dot tuple elements goes and it, it probes to tuple element. Variant type, same way. So these are wrappers around the customization points. Now let's look at the good ones. Yes, Demben. If, if, uh, if return type is a tuple, can you skip dot 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 and it return You can. You can chain these together. Good question. Uh, ben asked, if you, if you have a type, a function type, and the return type is a tuple, you can say t dot uh, return type dot square bracket uh, colon, and that will slice it. And then you'll get a pack of all the tuple elements. Or you could just say t dot return type dot tuple elements. And that does the same thing. And that would work the same for a struct as well, right? The, the operator will work for a struct and return the non-static, the types in the non-static public data members. OK, let's look at the good ones. String, C++, there's no way to convert anything to a string. Uh, um, this spells out any compile time entity. I had the six parameter kinds. This works for all six parameter kinds. And now since we have this reflection um, that will like programmatically generate string constants, we want to be able to concatenate them. So plus we'll concatenate string constants. I can't use this, the preprocessor to concatenate them because I don't know it's a string constant when the lexer runs. And then I also do string comparisons. So you can ask like, what's the character mapping? I use care traits uh, over whatever type of constant, colon, colon, compare. So it's whatever's on the system I use. Yes, sir. Sorry, what string type? Is this just like a tar star, or is there some special string? It is a, uh, it's like a string literal. So it's a character, a constant character array, an L value to a constant character array. Okay. So it's not a pointer. It may decay to a pointer if you do anything interesting with it. But it's just a, um, it's a constant array, and that's why you can concatenate them. And I know the provenance. I know they're null terminated, because I control the compiler. And so when you concatenate them, it pops off the null terminator on the left-hand side, and glues them together, creates a new, issues a new constant. Uh, so C++, yes, David. Uh, if, if they're just character arrays, uh, how do you handle, like, if you do a quality right now, you can do a pointer and pointer quality? No. Um, I've overloaded the comparison operators on string constants. In general. In general. I don't think if you compare string constants right now, it will decay to pointers. If I, if I made a faux pas, then I apologize. But as far as I know, maybe, maybe, maybe they would, maybe they would, maybe this does give different behaviors if you try to compare two string literals, but I don't know. Um, that would compare, well, that would compare pointers to the string literals, which would be equal because of deduplication. And this will compare the actual string literals, which would be equal because they're the same thing. So maybe it's the same, but um, bother me afterwards if, if, if I'm incorrect on that. Okay, so you wanna, you wanna do this in C++ right now, so you wildly start Googling, and if you're fortunate, you come across a Stack Overflow page, which is like uh, a zillion responses over, uh, over hundreds of years. Um, and uh, this is the way to do it. This is like the best practice, which is to use argument deduction, because we have to put the type we're trying to stringify into a template parameter, and then we're using a compiler-specific symbol. It's not a macro exactly, it's like a built-in. Pretty function on Linux compilers or func sig on Windows, and then we're we're removing some number of 
bites from the beginning and the end. And we hope that this decorated name will reflect the string we want. And somebody says, thanks for the very nice detective work. <laughs> there have been attempts to make this more readable. So since we have string view in 17, we can, we can turn this into a C++ 17 thing by using the remove prefix and remove suffix member functions. These are like const expert. So now we've made it better by using member functions on string view, but we still have this weird compiler specific thing and sometimes the compilers change and there's more de developed versions that have them like version macros in here to test. Um, a happy customer said this is a great distillation of efforts over the past several C++ versions into something that's short and sweet. Uh, this breaks my heart. Um, <laughs> Like what a bad user experience. So this is the first slide again. You know, just put dot string after everything. Eh, okay. Now, uh, these are the high value ones, I think. So this is the same member trait namespace. So if you have a type on the left-hand side, t dot is specialization. Is this type a class specialization? That's a constant. t dot template. Give me the template, the class template of the specialization. So if you have a, a if you specialize a vector or specialize a string or whatever, uh, t.template will give you back std vector or std basic string. Arg count, the number of arguments in the specialization. And then uh, you can access any of the arguments as parameter packs, but because there's six kinds of semantic um, template arguments, you need six kinds of, of uh, member traits here. So if you say um, t.type args and you're doing that on a vector specialization, it'll give you back a pack of two types. The first one is the type of the element and the second one is the allocator. And, these, and when you say t.template, it gives you back the full class template. Uh, and you can continue to use all the default template arguments and all that stuff. All right, so uh, this is like a silly example. Uh, it's, not, it's probably not useful for anything, but just like consider the mechanisms at play. So I have an alias template rebind. And this shows a, a really simple way to, to rebind the class template. So we have a type t. We're going to get the original class template out of that and then replace all the template arguments. So we're taking universal parameter pack params, and we're just going like, to throw out the old template arguments and bring in the new, new template arguments. It's one sweet line. No argument deduction. This is all imperative. Rotate args. Uh, t.template. So this takes the class template of that specialization t. t.universal args gives me back all of the arguments. And it's universal argument. It'll give me back non-types, uh, non types, type templates, concepts, et cetera. And they have like deduced semantics. So you can't do much other than forward them to other template arguments. But that's good because that's what we're doing. And we're using the slice operator. So this is a left rotate. So start at, slice at i and then go to the end and expand that. Uh, and then for the second thing, start at the beginning and, and uh, go to i and expand that. So we've just like done a left rotate imperatively. There's no argument deduction. Same thing for uh, insertion. You can insert a parameter or a pack of parameters at any point uh, using these imperative mechanisms. But there are better mechanisms I'll show you in a little bit. But this is just to show that we shouldn't be using argument deduction to solve problems like this. Yes? With the universal pack, is that all, uh, like all types or all values? Or can it be a mixture of types and values? Uh, the universal pack is just whatever your arguments are. It doesn't, allow, it doesn't provide operations that would violate. Um, like, you know, you can't, you can't just um, cast it to an uh, integer, because you can only do that to expressions. So it won't let you do that universal pack. Like, Universal pack is just like, give me this argument. Don't tell me anything else about it, but I can still slice it because that's generic enough where I can pass it to something else. Does that answer it? It's just. Yeah, so you could, you could have type and values in the same. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the entire point. All right, so uh, I showed you some like imperative ways. Well, maybe they're declarative. I'm not sure what the difference is in here, but I know they're not the old way of doing it. It's not template <laughs> metaprogramming. <laughs> OK, that's, that's even better. Um, OK, so some, some people are like a little iffy on this token. So I don't, hope we could not debate the token spelling. However, I, um, I overloaded the equal, equal, and not equal operators to work on all six kinds of entities. So they've always worked on non-types or expressions. And it continues to be the normal uh, equal comparison operator. But now you can compare types. We can compare templates, variable templates, concepts, and universal parameters. Uh, and you can c compare universals with any other kind. So this is just a generic way to see if two things are equal. It's a lot faster to compile than calling std is same and getting its value, or calling std is same v, or calling uh, std same as, which is the concept. Uh, it's a compiler specific, um, compiler intrinsic. It's more, more performant, and I think more clear to read. Um, so let's, let's take a look at it here. 
uh, <clears throat> let's create a concept called is specialization of. It tests if the, if the type T is a specialization of, specialization of the template temp. And you can pass any template in there because it uses a universal pack to uh, parameterize the template parameters of that, of that template template. And uh, the expression in the concept is just t.template equal equal temp. So uh, it pulls out the template and it compares it to temp. That's cool. I don't have to do any argument deduction. But I don't even need to do the concept at all because in the body of print, I can have like an if const expr switch and I can populate each of those conditions with a comparison. So I'm pulling out the specialization of the type T, or the, the, the class template of the specialization, and comparing that to vector. So if type T is any specializ specialization of vector, the branch on 11 is taken. If it's a specialization of map, the branch on 14 is taken. Otherwise, branch on, uh, branch on 17. So if you're writing a serializer, you're going to want to like, you know, switch on well-known containers so you can serialize them to the wire um, effectively. And this is a simple way to do that. Yes, sir? Uh, if it do, okay, so the question is, what happens if type T inherits std map? This will not, this will not be true in that case. You'd have to use a different primitive like is base of. Also, if if one of these undergoes substitution failure, what if you pass int? Int dot template is a substitution failure. But I overloaded this equal equal operator so that it catches substitution failure. So if if you say int dot template, or if type T is int and you say type T dot template, that's a substitution failure, but it's done in the context of comparison. So instead of getting ill form program, which is bad, you get a false result, which is good. It's int is not a vector. So that's just like a convenience I put in. It's not you could say, well that's like a weird way to handle Sfide, but I think it's good. Yeah. Well, T, okay, T is already a type, right? right? So I want to, this, this is a check to say if it's a specialization of a template, right. then I want to get the actual temp, the class template out of it. Right. So it's, it's changed the kind. It went, that turns it from a type to a right. class template. Right. Yeah, without, without deduction. It's just, it's, it's a declarative thing. Yes? Can I use dot, 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 question mark, question mark on my class template there? Uh, Yes. Oh, okay. The question is, can you use like these uh, const x for multi-conditional? Could I say, if I have a pack t, ts, is a pack of types, could I say like ts dot template equal equal vector? Uh, question, question, int dot dot dot, which would give me the index of the first pack element, which is a specialization of a vector, right? You can, you can do those kinds of queries, and that, that is a very good example of using that weird operator. Yeah. All right. Um, the universal template parameter paper, um, one of their primary motivations for adding the feature, which is a great feature, is to test if something's a specialization of a class template. So they have a concept, is specialization of, but you can't do partial s templates of a concept. It's just not possible. So they delegate to a variable template because you can partially specialize variable templates. Um, it's not commonly done. It's like not a well-known thing, but it, you got impl I mean, implemented it. I was surprised when I came across it. So if, the, if the, pat the patterns always match the primary template, the question is, does the pattern match the partial? If it does, the partial is chosen because it's more specific. That's the way you know, um, partial deduction works. And so in this case, it'll be true. So there, if you want to use um, P1985 to, do, to test if something is a specialization, you, you create an instantiation of the concept, and then you instantiate both the, the primary and the partial template. And there's a lot of deduction. And uh, why not just use the imperative method, right? So that's line six. Just do a comparison. OK, we're almost done with the member traits. So enums are pretty simple. I'm only exposing enum count, which is a scalar, enum names, which is a pack of string constants, or constant string array, um, character arrays, constant character arrays, and enum values, a pack of the enumerator constants. Class traits, there's a lot more because classes are more complicated. Um, you can get a pack of the bases. Uh, you can get a pack of base offsets. Um, you see these things like dot at base values and dot member, dot at member values. If the left-hand side is a um, expression of class or union type, then I can't just say like x dot y because it'll do regular member name lookup for y. So then I gotta like modify the member trait name so that it's not an identifier so the compiler knows not to do uh, regular member lookup. So this is just like a mangling um, 
of the of the member member trait to make it distinct from from name look. You say, well, that's like a that's not beautiful. But remember, at the beginning, I said beauty is not the goal. Uh, adaptation is the goal. Fitness is the goal. So, yeah, I know it's it's not ideal, but um, C plus um, plus is not ideal. So this is a way to get reflection, uh, and it gives you the packs of whatever you want: member pointers, member offsets, member names, etc. And then finally, if you want to do any reflection on the universal parameters, you can do that. So you can have a if const expert chain in your definition that tests, is this universal parameter a type? Is it a template? Is it a variable template? And then you can convert semantically that um, universal template parameter to the kind of argument that, that it's confirmed that it is. OK, three, four minutes. Circle imperative arguments. This is control flow in lists, list building control flow. Um, Consider template argument lists, function argument lists, braced initializer lists. Um, I've added a whole bunch of mechanisms. I'm going to show two of them today, argument if and argument for, that let you write ifs and fors inside of argument lists. Uh, if is a filter. So you can say if predicate, which is a, a Boolean predicate, then fat arrow generic argument, or fat arrow generic argument else some other generic argument. And that generic argument can be another one of these if statements. It can be the for, or it can be any kind of template parameter argument. Um, here's, a, here's a usage. So let's take the function parameters x and create an array that only has the doubles. So I'm comparing if ts is double, and that's a pack, then emit the corresponding function parameter x, and then we're going to expand that. So we've just filtered all of our function parameters into a list, and then the list is, uh, infers its size from the size of the brace initializer. So we can do that into the initializer list, or we can do it into a function argument list. If ts dot is integral, then emit x. So this chests all the x's. If they're integral, it emits them to the list. Otherwise, it ignores them. And I can do if else. So I can either pass uh, an integer x, or I can pass the string not int. Um, here's another example, doing it into template argument list. So let's say I want to uh, take a template, decompose its uh, arguments, and then just like filter out all the ones that are non-integral. So it just like throws things away. This is this kind of declarative style. Um, there is a scalable reflection proposal, and the latest update was from January, and they have this is their first example, and this is to use reflection to select the values um, of a certain type from a function parameter list. So there's function parameter list TS, I'm sorry, there's a template uh, parameter set TS, there's a function parameter pack P, but that's not used anywhere in this uh, reflection code. So it calls current function, which is a library to support metaprogramming, and then it calls parameters of, which is another library call. And then it does a template for, which is a mechanism that's not in the standard yet, to loop over them, and then it uses this um, reflex per operator, I believe, the caret, to turn t into a value, and then it does type of, which is another thing, and then it does a slice, and then it has a pushback. Um, and I just have this one, this one little snippet, if t equals ts, then name it p, dot, dot, dot. And I think when you don't have reflection, all of life's problems can be solved with reflection, you assume. But I've had reflection since the beginning of this, and now I realize that reflection is not the solution of all of our problems. Sometimes it's lack of control flow in certain contexts. So um, I think it's good to keep our minds open and not just get fixated on one kind of technology. If we can make small changes, and this is the, this is the fitness I'm talking about. Like evolution works in, in many ways, and we have like many weird organs that derive through, through different ways. It's not, a single, it's not a single strategy. It's like whatever improves the fitness of the language I think is worth using. Yeah. Oh, right. I didn't use the regular arrow in C because that would be, that would be ambiguous with the postfix arrow operator, the member operator. Um, the Herb Sutter pattern matching proposal uses these, this arrow, and I think the other pattern matching proposal does too. So I already have this token in the compiler to support his pattern matching. So if you don't like the token, you, can, you know how to contact Herb about that. <laughs> now, I, added, I talked about argument if just to whet your appetite for the for loop. So this is a for loop you can do in argument lists. I have a lot of forms, but I'm showing you two of them here. Uh, the first one is just over uh, an integer counter. So you say 4i colon 10, and that will expand this 10 times, right? It'll, it'll, it'll march forward and evaluate the generic argument 
10 times, and I will be updated to that step counter each time. Or you can um, source it on a pack. There's six kinds of packs, so there's kind of six variants of this. So um, for decal colon pack, we'll uh, pull out one element of the pack and then step through it. And so now decal is in scope when you evaluate the generic argument. The point of this is to reduce the dimensionality of the pack. I don't allow you to uh, take packs of packs because I think expanding packs of packs of packs of packs is um, very, that way lies madness, right? So if you, wanna, if you wanna do multiple pack expansion levels, write a for loop, nested fours for all but the inner layer, and the inner layer can do a pack expansion, or you can just put another four in there. Um, I'm, I'm, for the program of sanity, I, I make it obligatory to disambiguate which kind of declaration you're introducing. So if you have a, you know, a concept pack, you have to use the concept token right there. Um, so this is what, this is the kind of the problem that my for loop is trying to solve. MD span is in 23. It has this alias template dextents. And dextents is just a specialization of the extents class template with the dynamic extent um, constant spammed out rank times. So this is a for loop. So it spams out dynamic extent rank, rank times on, on extents. And this is an immediately invoked lambda. And it's 20, it, it requires C20 because the that pack template parameter pack is part of a lambda, and that's a 20 feature. Uh, this is the way it's actually written in the Cocos code to be more compatible with older compilers. This is a uh, recursive partial template specialization. This is the way I would write it because I've never really got the hang of, of some of the more advanced immediately invoked lambdas. This is the way I would write this for loop. But this is the way Circle writes the for loop. So you say, well, it's like weird and it feels foul to like put fours and to put ifs inside of argument lists. But this is, this is state of the art right now. This is like best practice. This is written by language experts. And this is how you write a for loop in C++. <laughs> so I think that's bad. And if you think for looks weird, okay, just keep writing it this way. <laughs> All right, I'm on, I think I'm on schedule. Pack meta functions. Uh, this is truly declarative. So um, if the left-hand side's a pack, any kind of pack, you can use these meta functions to create a new pack that has undergone some transformation. Now, um, those circle imperative arguments features, the if and the for, and I have some others I'm not sharing with you, they're powerful. I've written Conway's Game of Life entirely in a template argument list. I've written a sort that's like pretty good, a pretty good sort entirely in a template argument list, and it is symbol soup. So once I like internalize that, I think, ah, I don't wanna keep doing symbol soup. So let's define it as a function. So uh, pack.unique will uniquify a pack. It just throws out the redundant elements as it goes along. Dot filter, there it takes a predicate, which is a little fragment of code. The underscore zero token is defined, that indicates the current element, and then you can uh, yield a bool. And if it's true, then you're gonna keep the element. If it's false, you're gonna kick it out. Python, JavaScript have stuff just like this. Sort, uh, you can sort parameter packs, and that's a compiler intrinsic, it takes like no time. Underscore zero is the left uh, key, underscore one is the right key. You compare them somehow, return true or false, and it internally, the compiler is using std stable sort from the STL. So you get a stable sort, but the comparison operator in the compiler is template instantiation. Sort indices does key index pair sorting and returns the indices, so you can sort stuff, get the indices back, and then gather later. Find, I think this is the most useful one, it finds the index of the first element in the pack. And this works for any kind of element, non-type, type, whatever. Right now I'm returning minus one for no match. Arguably I would want to return the pack size for no match, but I haven't gotten to a point where I want to do an immediate insert. It's not the way this works. It's flexible. This is just a provisional thing. This is what I like, but obviously this um, system is really flexible so we could add or modify as needed. Find all returns the indices of all elements arg in the pack. So find, all, find returns the first one. Find all returns a pack of matches, the indices of the matches. Contains all. The pack contains all elements and args. That's Boolean. It's either true or false. So does t dot contains all t2. Does t contain all the elements in, in t2? Contains any. Same thing. And count. Counts the number of matching elements in the pack. Let's take a look. Yeah. The pack already has an order. So if the pack's a... Uh, no, 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 between the elements. Oh, I, what's this? Oh, no, answer, answer. Um, the pack has an order. The, the pack has semantics. It's either a type pack or a value pack, whatever. 
Um, and then this, this transformation just does what it does. I, don't, I mean, I think there's an order in it, and if the order's changed, that's because that's part of the um, kind of post-condition of the, of the operator, the meta function. Yeah? Are these meta functions user-definable? They are not user-definable. They're compiler built-ins. However, um, I think that's probably the best way to do it, because user-definable meta function would require really fundamental language extensions. Like, how does a language return a pack of any semantic kind? That's like creating a new language. Yes? Uh, I mean, a f like a .fold? Yeah, like, just like does meta I don't have a fold in there. I mean, I have the regular C++17 fold. But if, if you think fold is too ugly, um, well, use dot count because sometimes you just want to add stuff up. How many m matches are there? Count is a kind of fold. So it's more likely this would be more specific than a fold. A fold is a more programmable operator. But if you want to do with a lot of things. Yep. Uh, all things are possible. Okay. So uh, let's consider uh, writing out, serializing, stringifying an object. So I have an object T on line 16. It's got fields, name, birthday, age, job. So I create an object and I call print object. And now I want to print out the pairs of member names and member values to see out, but I want to sort them by the member name. And the member names are constants and they're available at compile time. So I'm going to say object t.membernames. And that's going to be the pack of name, birthday, age, job as constants. And I'm going to call sort indices. And then I'm going to provide a predicate. And the predicate's going to get, in underscore zero, it's going to get a string constant. And underscore one's going to get the string constant, as stood stable sort in the compiler is being called. And as a comparison, that's a string compare. It's care traits compare. And it returns true or false. And then the compiler sorts your pack. And it returns to you a pack of the corresponding indices of this key, of key index sort. And then I expand that into a list. And the list is on line three. It's just a list of stuff. And then I can print it out with a gather. So I've sorted. I've got the, the, the uh, gather indices, and now I have a single pack expansion statement on line 11. This is all one line, really. And I'm saying object t.member names. This is a pack of member name constants. I'm using dot, 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 the subscript operator that Chris had to talk about yesterday. And I'm gathering uh, from the indices that I've just sorted, because sorted.nontype.arg is a pack of indices. And I'm going to then stream out the colon operator. So I have a nice colon on the right-hand side, and then do the same thing with the member values. So I'm, I'm serializing. I'm using reflection to serialize member names and data members, and I'm using the meta function to change the order in which that operation is done. Question? No. OK. More pack meta functions. These are set operations. Dot append just glues two things together. Boring. Dot union. That creates a set union. This is good because it throws out duplicates. So um, take the elements in the left-hand side and then stream out the elements on the right-hand side that aren't, aren't already on the left-hand side. This is a set union. Very good. Set intersection, difference, symmetric difference. This works on unsorted packs, unlike the standard library version. The compiler knows how to compare them, so you get these pack operations. You can insert some number of arguments at an index. You can replace arguments at an index. You can erase some number of arguments uh, at an index, and you can rotate. Yes? Um, when you say union deduplicate, if you know, your left hand side is int, int, int. Uh, you'll get three ints out. Okay. So it, it, um, it kind of like, there are semantics on how it deals with duplicates. Um, I, I don't know if they're what you want, but if they're not what you want, there are enough meta functions and things where you can compose things. You could uniquify them. You could do whatever you want to, to get what you want. OK, uh, this is a variant select function. So let's say we have two variants. One of them's specialized on a pack TS1. One of them specialized on a pack TS2. And I want to return a new variant that has the active element from one of those two things. So this is a conditional operator over a variant. Um, but what's the return type? The return type has to be a union of all the types in v1 and all the types in v2. But I can't allow any duplicates because that would screw up my variant. You can't have a variant with duplicates and still expect to have real functionality. So I call ts1.union ts2. And this gives me a deduplicated union of, of uh, pack elements. That's the return type. So I have to redeclare the return type on line 10 because C++. And then I want to visit. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no converting constructor in std variant to convert one variant to another variant. So I have to use std visit. So line 12 is my std visit. So I either visit v1 or I visit v2 based on the condition b. And then in the visitor, x is one of the elements, the active variant member. 
And then I just return. I return that through the return type. And that now calls the constructor on the return type um, variant. So I've converted a variant of type TS1 or a variant of type TS2 to a variant of the union of those. So that's a really slick way to use these set operations. And now I've got all these like set operations on packs. Sometimes it's nice to create a pack out of whole cloth. So you can use these pack creation mechanisms, non-type dot, 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 type dot, 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 et cetera. These are unambiguous to the parser. Create a list of things, and now I can chain together pack meta functions, these type traits, uh, all the other dotted things you see in this. Or feed them to um, fold expressions or whatever you have. So now we're ready to rewrite the standard template library. Let's start with the tuple, um, tuple data layout. OK, like you've kind of seen this before. I just want to use a pack member declaration to declare the members. And let's see what a getter looks like. Um, the standard uh, mandates four different getters. I think it's like a, an equivalent getter. Maybe I should have put the forwarding reference on the right-hand side on this one. But it's, a, it's an equivalent getter. And I'm doing a uh, constant time, as we've seen from the Chris's talk, it's con measurably constant time lookup for i. So tuple dot, now tuple, with lowercase, is a dependent type. So it, this is dependent name lookup. And I have to tell the compiler to expect a pack on the right-hand side so that this whole member expression is a pack. So I have to use the, the, tr the leading dot, dot, dots there. Point of contention for the committee, but it shouldn't let us get in the way of getting this feature into the language. And then I use the subscript operator, dot, 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 square bracket i, and that returns the ith element. And then I register it with the customization points on 17 and 20, and then I can use it as a regular tuple. I can say dot tuple elements, and that will probe the customization point tuple element. I can use the dot square bracket, the tuple slice operator. So this is like, you know, a pretty functional tuple with just a few lines. How does stud apply work? Uh, question about trivial constructability. I have no idea what the... Oh, okay, the question is about how do you define constructors. This is just the data layout. I, I have online like a full version, and that does have the constructors that are very burdensome and onerous that are mandated by the, by the standard. So in reality, it's not this nice, but it's not this nice because I try to actually emulate the, the, the one in the standard. So I, I fully implement the interface, including all these now unnecessary constructors, perhaps. Let's look at std apply. Um, std apply just calls function f, and it passes all of the elements, the values from the tuple. And it's not like a std tuple, it's just any tuple-like object. Um, and this requires argument deduction to get the indices to feed to get. So you can't write it in one, in one shot. It's always two functions, and there's, two, and there's a total of four std forwards here. Um, to me, this is not the best way to destructure a tuple. So I've written it this way. I've got the forward um, directive on the, on the parameter f, the forward directive on the parameter t. So whenever I use f or t, it's implicitly the right value category. And then I just call std invoke, pass it f. It's really forwarded. And then I destructure t, t dot dot dot, because at the end of a argument list, you can just say dot dot dot, and that will first slice it, and then it'll expand the slice. It's just less symbols. So this is my std invoke. And the question now is like, do we need std invoke? No, we can operate directly on on uh, these kinds of data, data uh, objects. Let's look at get. Now, this isn't the normal get that takes an index. This is the get that takes a type. This requires a search. So you have to search through the argument list or the tuple elements and find the first occurrence of that type and then return that. Actually, the standard mandates it be the only occurrence. So the standard mandates that t occurs exactly once in the pack, and it returns a reference to that element. So it's going to forward to the, the indexed version of get. And there's four overloads. So I want to do it with one overload and no effort. So this is uh, the LLVM libc++ implementation. On the right-hand side, you see this four overloads. On the left-hand side, you see template metaprogramming. This is my kind of imperative version. It uses a fold. So I've got a generic comparison, t equal equal types. I expect that to be true precisely once, or else the precondition is violated, and I assert. And now I do a search. So I have this uh, dot, 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 question, question stuff. And that finds the first occurrence, the only occurrence, of t in the pack types. And then I just uh, call get with that. But this is like too, it's like too academic. So let's use those meta functions. So I can say, how many times does t occur in types? Types.count t. That's pretty clear. 
count how many times t is in types. It's one, it has to be one. And then find t in types, this returns an index. It's not gonna be minus one because we've already stipulated right here, we've already asserted that it's not minus one. It's gonna be found and we're gonna re forward this to the, um, the other getter. It'll do ADL, it'll find the getter. Um, yeah, so this is a std get with these pack meta functions and this is state of the art C++. Tuple cat. Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I had this like hullabaloo about the argument for, and this is where I really use it because I have to loop over a pack and then I have to destructure each element of that pack. So that's like two levels of packness. I don't support multiple pack expansions because there be dragons. So I require you to, to loop over the outer dimension, which is the pack tuples. And now for each element in that pack, I have a new type called tuple. And then I uh, strip off the CV ref and I, I blow out its elements. So this will concatenate all the elements and all the tuples. And so this is the return type for the function, right? It's constant expert function. The return type is std tuple over this uh, linearized set of elements. And then to uh, get the brace initializer, I do another loop. So it's four tuple in tuples, but now I'm looping over the function parameter pack tuples and it's marked with forward. So it's implicitly stood forward everywhere, which is just like what the mandate says you have to do. And then I blow out that, that, uh, that member. So it, it loops over all the arguments and it blows out their elements. And when I say blows out their elements, it calls std tuple size, reads out the value, then calls std get or uh, ADL get for each of the values in the pack and concatenates them. So this is uh, two dimensions of uh, value concatenation within an argument list, you return that, and that, that hits the std initializer list um, constructor or whatever the, 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 not the initializer list constructor, I guess it's just the regular constructor for std tuple. So this is the tuple cat. Circle way, and this is the C++. Why do you remove the form for the ah. uh, it has to be done. So if you pass uh, a tuple by L value, then uh, deduction, since I'm using um, uh, forwarding reference, tuples amp ampersand, that will deduce that type as an L value reference. And, um, and, and that like corrupts, well, I don't think that even works with std tuple size or std tuple elements. Um, or yeah, so that so you have to strip off that that um, L value reference, and then you have to strip off the C the constant volatile references because for some reason the standard changes the types of CV qualified tuples when you probe tuple elements. It actually puts the constant volatile on there, and we want to return values. We don't want to return like a constant because we were passed a const reference. We want to pass an int. We're doing a, a, a true value copy. So yes, this is obligatory, and if you could if you could you know work your way through this, you would see that this does it too. Although you just have to take my word. Right. Let's look at variant. Variant data layout. Um, same thing. It's w really one line, line 10. So I can blow out a pack of elements inside a union. And now I have a pack of uh, union members. And then I initially set it to um, value this by exception, which is like the number of, number of slots. I implement the default constructor, line 18 is just like default constructing element zero, which is uh, congruent with the standard. You have to implement a trivially destructible uh, destructor, and you have to, this is like conditionally trivial destructor is part of 20 or 23, I forget, but 20, sure. So uh, I have a defaulted constructor if all the types are trivially destructible. Otherwise, I have to call reset. So now line 26. Um, uh, we have an active variant because the index isn't valueless by exception. How do we destruct the variant? Um, Andre gave a comprehensive talk on this at CPPCon. He calls his approach the converse factory method. He uh, talks about typeless data structure, of course. Uh, he talks about like the nitty gritty vagaries of deduction on packs. Um, I think it's disappointing that uh, destructing a variant involves things from hell. There shouldn't be really any corner cases from hell in something that should be simple. Um, he gets to the hard part and considers indirect function dispatch. Like, do you want to actually have a switch or do you want to create a table of pointers and, and jump into that? And then he does uh, divide and conquer algorithms for destructing a variant. He does algorithm analysis for variant destruction. Um, it should be one line, line 26. This is the same operator, the multi-conditional operator I used on the enum to string. We're going to create a pack of things. The pack of things is sized according to other packs in the expression. Compare that to the active index. If it's true, then we're going to call the corresponding pseudo destructor m dot 
squiggly types. Um, in this case, M is a pack and types is a pack. So during template instantiation, it will be substituted with the corresponding variant member. So this creates a cascade of conditionals that, that um, probes all of the variant alternatives and that will be promoted to a switch operator by LLVM and that will maybe lower to a jump table. So this is like pretty sweet because you allow the compiler backend to worry about optimization and branching. Same thing here, like I, like I said, it's the same pattern. The same pattern occurs again and again. You have some runtime entity, which is either the index of the active member or a, an enum. You do some comparison, you do some test, and then you use the multi-conditional operator, and the, the center thing is what has to go to compile time. It's either the, the enum name, which is a compile time entity, or the pseudo destructor, which is a compile time entity. Let's look at the copy and move constructor. So here's a copy constructor for variant, same thing. Uh, we look at the right-hand side's active index. W is the right-hand side. So we pull out its index, compare it to the current element. But now instead of doing a pseudo destructor, we're going to call placement new. So we have to do a copy placement new on, from the right-hand side, w.m, w .m, to the member pack declaration M on the left-hand side. We know, uh, we put a built-in unreachable at the end, but we know it's not unreachable because we've guarded against that with the is valueless by exception. So this just creates a cascade um, where the, the thing that's done when it matches is a placement new. Let's look at the subsumption constructor again. This is what I introduced a little bit before to show off union. Um, I didn't like it because you have to call std visit, and I don't think you have to call std visit. So let's create a constructor that will construct a variant on the left from a variant on the right. The precondition is that the left-hand side that we're constructing contains all the types on the right-hand side, so it can represent all the possible alternatives. How do we do that? We use the meta function. Types dot contains all types too. Declarative, you know what it does. We know the left-hand side subsumes all the types on the right-hand side. And then it's basically a normal copy constructor except line 168, the placement new. Uh, slot three on the right-hand side may map to slot five on the left-hand side. So I actually have to scatter to a different variant member. So I'm gonna find the index in types, which is the left-hand side set of types, for each type uh, on the right-hand side. So that's a search, types2 is a pack, types is a pack, and that's gonna return a pack of indices. Now these are scattered indices. I'm, I'm doing a search and then I'm scattering at compile time from the right-hand side member to the left-hand side member. And this is a subsumption constructor. You can construct one variant from another. I don't think this was put in the standard library, even though it's useful, because it, with current technology, it's probably too hard to implement or too costly to compile. But here, it's trivially more difficult than writing a normal copy constructor. And now, I can remove the visit, and I can just construct v1, or I can construct a return type from v1, or construct a return type from v2, because I'm, I'm using the new subsumption uh, constructor. It's the same visitor pattern, but now that visitor is internalizing the constructor as opposed to being a burden for the user. And I can like give it a whole pack, I can make it fully generic. Let's give someone a pack of variants and choose, oh, I want the return index three, index five, index whatever, this requires a full union over all these types. And here, this is just like the tuple cat. I'm creating a type parameter pack. I'm looping over all the variants. I'm getting out their type arguments. I'm flattening those into a new pack, and I'm calling dot unique. So I've munged all the types and all the variants together. I've uniqued them so that the return type is a well-behaved variant that houses all the, the uh, accessors available. And now I can use my, my old switch friend, the switch generating operator. When this is true, then construct the return type this guy, from the corresponding variant member. So this is uh, a cool use of the subsumption. There's multiple levels of, of visit. There's multiple levels of dispatch, but it's like transparently handled. Finally, MD span. Yes? Is no the variant does not require the types to be unique. However, almost all operations do require that. Uh, which one? Yeah, so if you, if you, yeah, it does find the first, but remember, um, the idea is that you give it to, you give it like a deduplicated, a, a good variant on both sides. So the first is the only one. The problem is when you have a variant. Hmm? Um, no, I don't think the operation does require uniqueness. It would find the first. Right, this will find the first element. So if types two is a bad variant that has like three versions of double, I think it would still work. Maybe not, because it contains all. No, yeah, I think it would break. I think it would break. Yeah? Why are you calling that a bad variant? 
because a lot of the accessors don't work. For instance, std, std get, um, I believe, stipulates that the variant occurs only, that the type occurs only once in the variant. Is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, fine, let's do MD span. Um, this is like a really hard class because <laughs> it, it's all about this extents class template, which is a collection of extents, and they can be static as in parameterized at compile time, or they can be dynamic, in which case they require a non-static data member. And what would normally be an array where you can say, oh, give me index five, give me index three, or, or rank three, or rank five, is now like an irregular data management problem. So we have to worry about partially static storage. Consider um, an extent class storage T, and we have to, do, do, we have to uh, make sure the empty base optimization works. So we have to make sure all the types are unique, or else EBO won't kick in. In this case, no unique address won't kick in. So I have a, a complete type on line eight, and this is the uh, static extent case. So in this case, the, the data member is static, static extent. And the partial for dynamic extent, dynamic extent is just minus one, that has a size t extent. So the, the type on line 16, that partial is eight bytes. And the, the complete type is, is one byte, but we really want it to be zero bytes because it's empty and we hope to elide its layout when it comes to um, the container. So the container on line 20, we're gonna spam out a pack of these and we're gonna, we're gonna make each Specialization unique by specializing over the integer pack in dot, dot, dot. So that'll be like, you know, index will be 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. So it doesn't matter what the extents parameter is. We're, we're getting a unique type for each member, and that allows the empty base optimization to kick in and alias different empty types to offset 0 so you don't end up with a bigger type than you want. And this is mandated by their, by their uh, proposal. And then the getter is simple. Line 24 is a getter at compile time, which is the subscript operator, and line 29 is a getter at runtime, which is the switch. So this is the very last exercise. I have three minutes and 40 seconds left. Um, the constructor. So there's a regular constructor on line 33. This takes a pack of extents. And that pack of extents matches the rank of the container. The, you can see the requires on 32 is the size of the pack equal to rank. If it's true, great. We just initialize each member M with the corresponding function parameter EXTS. If it's a static extent, it'll ignore that. It'll ignore that extent because it has a static if it's dynamic, it'll, it'll save that. The problem is the dynamic extent constructor. And this choice to feature this, this thing on line 46 really hurt the implementation of MD span, at least the Cocos implementation. It is really, really, really complicated. And the, the problem is how do you initialize data members from an irregular set of function, function parameters? Let's break this apart, and I'm going to use some, like, old circle compile time programming to help uh, emit information to guide us and understand what's going on here. It's my implementation. So the requires clause is true if this uh, parameter pack has rank dynamic elements, which is the number of you know, dynamic, dynamic extents. And it's not equal to rank. So there are some dynamic extents. And uh, I, I, have to, I have to use this constructor. So I want to gather, I have to gather I want to initialize each member M, which is on line, the line of, end of line 41, with either a dynamic extent, extents, or the appropriate member, the appropriate pack element uh, from the function parameter pack. So I do this, um, this const per conditional, the question question, and that's short circuit, so I'm not, I'm not in, unintentionally doing a subscript on a pack when I don't want to be doing it. So if the current extent I'm initializing is dynamic, I, I, I specialize find dynamic extent, which is the variable template on line 33. And that windows the extents, which is the class template parameter, which is a mixture of non-zero values for static extents and minus one for dynamic extents. It windows that to I, and it counts how many dynamic extents. So it counts how many dynamic extents I've already seen, and that is now my gather. So then I pass it to the uh, pack subscript operator and gather. So this, this, um, this, find, this ca window count uh, and gather operation is all done entirely on the sub-object initializer for M. And then on line 46, I just do a loop and replay and tell you what's going on. So you see uh, on line 60, I have four dynamic extents and three static extents. So I provide four function parameters. And I've, there's a total of seven things I have to initialize. So on line 46, I just run through all seven ranks. 
the first rank is static. So that this branch is taken or this branch is taken, it just gets its own static extent, no problem. But then for uh, parameter one, it's dynamic. So I have to do a gather. So I call find dynamic index. Uh, the pack index is one for this case. So I window extents between zero and one. I count the number of dynamic extents there. There are no dynamic extents that I've already found. So I return zero and then I gather from uh, parameter zero. And, and this is a way to map um, truly irregular data to, um, we can map irregular data to a more regular data type. M is basically a regular data type. The function uh, parameter pack EXTS is irregular. And, and this set of meta functions and um, circle features allows us to bridge this divide without contaminating the, the whole structure of the class hierarchy, essentially. Okay, um, I, think, I think these, these you know, imperative and declarative mechanisms can help us not have to do traditional template metaprogramming. Thank you. Bryce. What was the plus meta there? Oh, that's sticky meta, it's sticky. So everything inside is also meta. So it's all done at compile time. So if you see the output on the right-hand side, while it's compiling, it's printing these diagnostics. When it's running, like this stuff doesn't even exist. But you know, I don't want to like cause a riot here, so I, I kept the meta stuff to a minimum. Yep, Dave. Uh, not a pejorative, no, no insult intended. No. I just, I think we started from, I mean, I think you, you would agree you start from base principles, right? Um, that's, I, I start from base principles constrained by the universe. And that's what I, okay. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Okay, so, so that. Um, I just felt that I had to like take a, a philosophical stance because there's so much. I'm not saying either of us are engaged in philosophy, but it seems like a lot of the discussion is at that level. That's all. Mm -hmm. so, like, I would rather program in certain meta programming at compile time than I would rather mm -hmm. than I would like to program in C at runtime. And you know, I, I know you gave up somewhat on on the whole, you know, we should be able to do everything at compile time approach. But I think a lot of that's because you were able to find a much nicer syntax than what we do at runtime. So I haven't abandoned the old stuff, the circle classic, um, but I, I think I, I didn't really go through these, but I, I would say that C++ contains the body plan of language that crawled from primordial soup. There's like BCPL still in there, and I think that it's, it's hard to kind of um, get rid of all the old primordial DNA and reboot it um, with something different. And, and the pack, the sequences, all that manipulation I showed today, this is like new space. That I've, that I've invaded. 
And I feel like I can do kind of whatever I want because it's not invalidating anything else. So for me, it's not clear how you could clean up even the runtime aspects of C++ to the degree where they feel more declarative and more satisfying. I, I would love to do that. I think that's a, a good goal, but to me, it's not, it seems like there's still be an impedance mismatch with the language as it exists today. I, I just, I don't have a, a clear way forward on that. Uh, David's on. Uh, I, I agree with your characterization. However, I've, I mean, I've been, I've been tinkering with this for a long time. And for me, um, trying to treat things as a, a single unified vision with like compile time execution and treating types as values and things like that, for me, there is an impedance mismatch between types and values and packs and values that um, created a burden. And it's true I'm creating new language elements, but it also reduces that burden. So for me, it's, it's purely a, a practical issue. I felt like that stuff you describe is good for some things. It's really great if you want to open a file at compile time, strip out some data, and then emit code. But for these kinds of fine, um, fine-grained metaprogramming tasks, like implementing std variant, I think that is both overkill and not specific enough. And I, 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 I took that scalable reflection snippet where they filter um, elements out of a function parameter pack into a vector as the kind of general programming approach. And you see it's way more complicated than, than using a, a more specific feature, a contextual feature like an uh, argument if. So I don't disagree with your characterization. That would be nice if we could do it in a more unified way. But for me, it's like that unified way has additional burdens, and I don't know if those burdens are worth it in all cases. Uh, Kristen. Yeah. That's, that's for everyone, yeah. Yeah, it's hard for me to understand, and like, it, it, it does kind of introduce some level of imposter syndrome, and it just makes the language seem really difficult to get learned in. Um, so I just wanted to say that this is really cool, and it's really nice to see like some Pythonic features in the static mm -hmm. language. That's really neat. Um, it's very intelligible, and it's clean. So I just Thank you. Like, think it's great, and good job. Um, Yeah, sure. <laughs> Dave, David Tingle. Um, so I think that I think that the key feature, the thing that really got me excited about Circle, was the idea to be able to program and compile time in the same way as they're programming at runtime. And what you've done here, I think, is you've made a language evolution um, that you have to add more features, but now these are just like more specific. I mean, it, but it does add the complexity burden to the language. Now there's more things to think about. There's more stuff to learn if you want to program compile time versus runtime compared to what you're calling legacy circle. So I mean, <coughs> I guess I want, I mean, I think C++ as a language is really complex and mm -hmm. ugly and hairy. But whatever language is, is next, I really want that key functionality that the same language at compile time that it used for runtime. Well, let's take teachability, right? You say it makes language more complex. So right now, let's do a Google for how do I count the number of occurrences of an element in a pack? You type that into Google, and then you go to Stack Overflow, and there's a whole bunch of descriptions 
Some of them are right, some of them are not. They work contextually. Some of them work for types, some work for values. But now with here, it would say, oh, well, there's an operator for it. It's like pack.count. And, and the language is bigger. I mean, there are new features. But hopefully, you can get to your solution faster. And we have tools to help us get to solutions, mostly in the form of Googling or asking other people um, or just looking at code. I'm not, I'm, I'm not convinced. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I wish I could get old style circle to give the best implementation of standard library um, classes, but I feel it's too coarse grained for that. If you want to do something like uh, load in a grammar file, like a, like a back of snore grammar from a file and then emit a parser for that, I would use a lot of old circle features for that because that's like a really heavyweight metaprogramming problem. But for something like this, I would, I would even, even with your, your comment, I would still prefer to use these, these fine grained things and I think they will work in conjunction. The language is not rich enough to just say, do everything at compile time. It needs additional mechanisms to, to have a di you know, better compile time semantics with just manipulating types and packs. I, I, I hope a synthesis can be found, but I'm just, I'm just trying to show something that I thought has been really useful for me personally. I mean, this is what I would use on an everyday basis, where I don't think I would use the more general form as much. Do I, okay, are, are you asking if I could write these in a more general purpose way? Using, or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, like, it's standing out to me that they're, everything is you have a defined compiler intrinsic. Yep. And what I'm hearing David, David uh, say is that, you know, they liked the circle classic, as you said, mm -hmm. way of saying at meta and being able to compose arbitrarily complex operations on these same things. You, you couldn't do that with. Circle Classic. You can do a lot of things, but you can't do these things really with Circle Classic. Um, it, it gave you compile time control flow. It gave you the ability to execute anything in compile time. It had an M type, which is like a, a boxed type so that you could treat a type as a value. You could pass it around. You could sort it that way. I mean, I could, um, you could still do a, a standard sort over the boxed values and kind of Circle Classic. Um, what is that giving you other than the the, the notion that you're using a general purpose language. It's giving you the notion you're using a general purpose language, but the actual user experience is worse because it's con it has more dependencies, it's going to compile slower. The errors will be more unscrutable because they could fail in library code. Um, I think from a, from a fitness standpoint, from an evolutionary fitness standpoint, these features are worth having in. I'm not saying get rid of other features, I'm saying I think these are good features to have in, but again, my goal here was not to persuade you about individual features, it's to persuade you that incremental improvements will like make the language more expressive. So if you're convinced of that, then at least like we have a, a way to work forward. Yeah, I, I totally, like, I, I love what you're laying out here. I, I really agree with the approach. I'm wondering if there's, if there's a way for, you know, you're having your cake and eat it too. Yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna have and eat cake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, which one? Oh, 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 yeah. Um, oh boy. <laughs> no, no, there's no slides at all. Okay, is it this one? Yes. Thing, I think that's, that's 
from a piece that I write, my impression is that there's suddenly a subfield of culture today. I'm now I'm programming in Haskell. Mm -hmm. That's not necessary. If you want to program and apply an understanding of it, go for it. But that's not what ordinary programming is doing. Right. So you mentioned you think the code on the right is, is prettier than the code on the left. But I think, I think the issue is a lot of people here may, I mean, the code on the left is not ideal, but they may say it's prettier in the sense that it's uh, written with more general purpose mechanisms, whereas the code on the right is written with more specific mechanisms. I, I agree with you that I, I prefer the more specific mechanism. It, it performs faster because there's no pushback. It's just a single initializer. But again, this, is, this, is, um, this really is a philosophical difference, I think. Which generalism? The two, two, um, the split out values. Yes, and that's a pattern. Mm -hmm. If we, we don't need to program the other program to extend the extended pattern, it, it's not that general. Right. Yes. Dave. Yeah. I mean, I, I just keep coming back to the, the fact that for those people that want it to be like traditional uh, circle, that a lot of these declarations, they have some bit of metaprograms to compute the type in it. And if you have to do that with, like, the whole point of this, of this pack expansion language John has is that it gives you a really expressive, powerful, concise way to do certain kinds of, uh, you know, sequence operations. And I can't imagine understanding a lot of those declarations had to put a regular C++ program in there. It would just be, you know, lines and lines. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I want this, you know, all of the features of this syntax back in the regular language because, like, we want to do the same kinds of things at runtime. Do you worry about then having <laughs> two languages in one language, two true it's, in which? It's, the, there are parts of C++ that need to lie. Right? I'm just a little concerned about, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Michael. So I, I tweeted while you were speaking, you hit the slide, that this is an embarrassment. Right? If on the left is what we desire, as opposed to what's on the right, then I think this is an embarrassment. And the reason I think it's embarrassing is because I, mean, I do a lot of metaprograms. Right? I, spend, <laughs> I spend years writing code that actually only ever runs at compile time. And all of the reasons that I want to introduce it are, I should say, 90% of the you have addressed with a very clean and understandable syntax. Why would I want to write imperative code for something that's declared? I, I, I just, and, and I don't understand why we wouldn't want to make tasks useful and usable without writing um, procedural code, right? That just doesn't make sense to me. So um, you have my vote. I think the left is an embarrassment. I want to see on the right. Thank you so much. OK. Yep. So if I'm writing a metal library, So I agree with your position, but I do think I don't want to be unfair to the left-hand side Thank you. because to me that's a copy if. Uh, it's a copy if? It's a copy if. How is the right-hand side not a copy if? It's also a copy if, but my point is that like, if you write what value is a type as a copy if, right, I'm not saying that the current proposal supports that, but if you write it as a copy if, you're still in our current C++ language algorithms, and you're a whole lot closer. In yeah, terms it's of not. Okay. So it's not. Yeah. I, so I'm sorry to interrupt. If, if you don't mind, uh, the reason it's not a copy if the copy if has a destination that's reallocated. Hmm. Right. This is this is all functional programming. This is you're going to do an operation right. produce a value. Right. The the distinguishing. So the left is, means it pushes, but the, the, no, the, the whole operation isn't a copy of it. It uses a copy of it, it's in the interior. Yes, right. But, but the fundamental things happening in all of this code is functional. In ball?
created a lot of library as my for the choir. And so I'm wondering about your thoughts about and, and I know this is like a fast life for you and you all this thing, but it's like not to sell on this question, but in general, how could we create like an ecosystem that would have you know people would be able to implement their extensions and so on? Like we have the library. Yeah. So I just wonder, maybe in a twist of notion of, like, could we maybe define this sort of a type that doesn't do the uh, reduction thing and use it? I'm just thinking of different ways, maybe, to generalize what you did. On, I mean, on the perfect forwarding, or the way I, the... Yeah. What I presented is not inclusive. Like I, I didn't touch on any of this stuff. And, and the kind of higher order features you're looking for, how do we libraryize things, how do we allow extensions, I didn't talk about that either. I, I will pretend I've solved it all and I'm choosing a, a different moment to talk about it, but really I, I don't know because it's an open question. Yep. Yes, I have given thought to it. Um, I, I think generative programming is so wide. Um, I mean, I, this is definitely the lowest level stuff that I have. And there is higher level stuff, but it's not as refined. And maybe it's, maybe it's what people want because it's more generic feeling. It's more like regular C++. But again, like Dave says, he doesn't like regular C++. He prefers the meta version. And he would rather backport this into regular C++. So I, I'm not sure what the right level of abstraction is. I don't know. I'm just, this is for me, this is evolution. I am mutating my organism and seeing which forms of it uh, are best adapted at solving programming problems. So I don't have strong opinions on, on which is best. I'm just trying to find something that is fit. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a, maybe two years ago, I, I like slices. I mean, Dave likes slices. I think for loops are a little inelegant, so I hijacked the range-based for protocol. Because that's kind of an extension point if you have like a begin and an end function or free functions or whatever, then you can write a, a range-based for, but range-based for is only on one collection. So what if we can make it work on multiple simultaneous collections, deal with unequal lengths, Stuff like that. So I have a, a, a pack operator, which is just square bracket colon. It's the regular uh, subscript operator, but you put a colon in there, you put a slice. So you can slice it. And when you slice it, that internally changes it into range base four over multiple containers. And then um, the question is, well, what happens? Like, how do I deposit elements? Like, you saw this argument if, where you can deposit elements into an argument list. You can do that at runtime by depositing it into a vector. So the square brackets by themselves, which is what Python uses for list comprehension, 
in Circle, you can do a Python-esque list comprehension where you're depositing elements into a std vector. And then it's actually really efficient because I don't have to like the pushback copy and stuff. The compiler knows the ABI. It knows the internal layout of, of std vector. So I'm like, I really do a good job like resizing it because I can predict how many elements are going to, or estimate at least how many elements are going to fit. I, I reserve it. Whoa. Well, it's, it's nice. good. I, I should I should dust that old stuff out and and bring it up to speed because it is super nice. It doesn't look like symbol soup because then I still I mean it's a list comprehension so it is a different grammar or it's a different language, and it is contextually dependent. Do people want more symbols or fewer symbols? I don't know. I mean there's yeah. Well, I mean, range is this pure library, so I don't know. I'd like to see I'd like to see performance numbers on that. And sure, I mean, I think I I developed my stuff like when range was kind of in ranges v3. It was like still experimental was being proposed, and I mean, I thought my stuff was a lot more concise. And since it was language feature, there wasn't some super heavy, super complicated template library. But even I think some of this stuff that I showed you would make a library ranges much easier. Just like the ability to pass concepts as template parameters, a lot of ranges are these like insane complex uh, concept hierarchies, and we could reparameterize those if we had like more flexible, more complete templates. So I think you could actually do a rewrite on uh, ranges, and if there are some missing features, I would add those. I mean, this is co-design. My, my standpoint is co-design. I rewrote some standard library classes, and that's, that's one design. And the co-design is, is adding circle features or modifying circle features to support a clean version of those. Because I wasn't going to write something I wasn't happy with. I control the compiler. I'm just going to augment the compiler. And if I were to rewrite ranges, I would do the same thing. I would add stuff to make ranges better. Um, and I think that's you know, a, good, a good place to be. Uh, yeah, I yeah, agreed. <clears throat> Thank you. Did I try implementing operator dot? I did not. Um, is the idea that I could make like a user definable meta function or something? I I understand the the desire, um, but. I'm driven by instinct and experience, and my experience is telling me, don't do that. That's all I can say. <laughs> Proxy classes? Do I want to do that? I don't know. I, you want to do that? Okay, all right, that's good, thank you.